client information is kept. So once you get this information, obviously PPS numbers and marriage, uh, date of marriage and all this kind of thing, you'll have that for any further transactions when you get it at the start. So, um, and um, when you when you take that step, it comes in like this and um, your client, if you have, now sometimes this won't, this section here with the, the tax numbers, this won't, um, it won't come out right because it's done in a particular way. So if you have more than one client, it might mix them up a bit. So you have to tidy that up and put in the, so if you have three, if you have three clients, for instance, you'll have to have three, you'll have to have three uh, rows here. So you put in, if you want to, you put in another one in there, put in the client's name. And if you have the tax number, now this code here, enter code is if the person you're putting in is already a client or in a different in a different capacity or on their own or whatever, you know, doesn't really matter, doesn't do very much in either. So I'll uh, delete that one because we've only got one client here. And just to check that the client is, um, that the, the status of the client is correct here, male and female doesn't matter. It's just that they're, well, it might do, but um, it's just that you have one client or more than one client. So you know, usually it's a couple or male or female. A group is to do with trustees and that kind of thing, which you won't go into. Um, so I'm going to, on the basis that I'm that I'm doing this, I'm setting up this file from scratch, I'm going to say that the client is resident for tax purposes and our marital status is married and... John, I have a Helen Levy look to you. I can't talk to anybody at the moment. Um, if you have their date of marriage, Uh, if you have the marriage certificate on file, usually it would be on the client side of the of the um, the client details. Well, I'll put in the the um, spouse's name there. So you might or might not have this information. So I'm putting in. I'm just randomly putting in something here. <clears throat> so I don't have the marriage certificate. So um, this is just to check the. This screen comes up just to check that you have the the client's details correctly, so the name of the client, but they're an individual or more than one, if you have their tax number and the name, the tax, if you had the tax numbers would appear in there. And uh, so then the next, so when you, sorry now, so that, uh, that button there is where the client information is kept. This is where the matter information is kept. The two buttons are up here as well at the top. Um, and so you can go into them at any time and they always appear down here on these screens anyway. So you can go into them at any time and if you see something that's not correct, you can change it by going in here. So you can go in to the matter information there. Obviously, there's nothing there at the moment because we haven't started the file yet. So then it asks you for the property address. Just put that in and what type of property it is. Now these are, these are just designed to um, bring up issues that might, might relate to um, various kinds of property like licensing, stamp duty, all that kind of stuff, planning, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see um, when I get up, when I move on how that works. So I'm going to, take one that's obviously there are there are, for stamp duty purposes they're a mix of uh, there's residential non-residential and mixed property you'll see that you'll see that in the stamp duty return so that's one issue um, uh, apartments obviously you have the whole issue of um, the months information and all that kind of thing um, commercial property you have rates and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'll i'll take the one that's the easiest mixed one which is the dwelling house and agricultural land so your your 
acting on the purchase of, of a residential farm. So it's a purchase. So I'm going to do a purchase today. I think I did a sale the last day, but I'd imagine that we'd probably have to go back over this a couple of times. So I can do a sale on, on another day. Um, it's really only a purchase and sale that is done fully. The, the other items, there aren't really. Um, well, of course, there's a lot of precedents are common to, to all of them anyway, but really it's only a sale and purchase that I have set up. So we say it's a purchase. So that this screen then just checks that you have the, tells you to go back and change it if you have it wrong. The basic details is the purchase, it's a dwelling house and agricultural land, and that's the property address. So then it brings in all the um, the usual stuff that, um, that you probably see. I don't know how much of this comes into the files that sec that other people open, but I think um, most of it does. So you have uh, your file opening form, etc. Conflict search section one hundred and fifty. Um, a reminder to get proof of ID, etc. And um, now the rest of them probably only come into my my system. So the you have the pre-contract questionnaire there if you want to send it to the client. So there's a step there to do that. So I'll just do that to show you what you can do. So so you can. If you open that, you can either say that you don't want to do it and it will postpone it, it will bring it down to the end, or you can, where did that go? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <clears throat> or you can write to the client. So you say yes, if you want to write to the client with the pre-contact questionnaire and ask you, can you ask you, do you want to do it by email or by letter? So you want to do it by email. So then it, uh, it just, um, the reason I'm doing this is a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I do works like this, so um, it asks you to attach the questionnaire there to the email and to send the email. So this will come up. Uh, sorry, no, no. Some of them come up in Word format, so so that you can have a chance to amend them, and some of them just come up as an email. So that's the email with the now you can obviously you can amend what I've said there. Sorry, I should have should have shown you that what it says. So it just says I enclose pre-contract questionnaire, etc. It's just a kind of a standard thing that I send. Sometimes I'll change it, sometimes I won't, you know. So John, does the pre-contract questionnaire cover everything we need? Uh, if short answer is no, it doesn't. Uh, the pre-contract questionnaire comes from the Law Society. I'll, you can see that it doesn't when I go on to, I do my question, well, my instruction sheet is slightly more comprehensive. And um, I think the order of the questions or the format of it, of the questionnaire is a bit, it doesn't, it's not very logical, but I've changed my instructions sheet to follow the same order of the questions in the questionnaire. I don't use the questionnaire that much. I think Joanne does, but I don't. I've used it a couple of times, but <laughs> I find that uh, clients are very lazy coming back with it, you know, so. Um, um, but anyway. Um, it's I've worked it, I've, I've changed it so that it will facilitate the questionnaire. Um, so that's the email there with the questionnaire. So that's um, so then there's a reminder in there. Um, is it going to? Um, so that's <clears throat> that's just a, that's just typical of what what the way this works. It says there's a there's a reminder there to confirm that you've got the pre questionnaire back. So um, if I just change the date on these here. Go to. So these are all my reminders here on the on the left hand side. So if I just change the date here on this one to today, it'll appear here. So it's at the top there. So 
John, we're not just saying that. I'm not just saying that. All I can say is the email that you've sent to Emma, but I haven't sure. just seen the last thing you did there. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I've closed the email. It might you might be it might be just frozen, is it? Can everybody else see it? Yeah, it works for yeah. me, John. Yeah, no, it's it now, yeah. Okay, right. <clears throat> so that's so that room so that's the so usually I have two or three uh, ones with due dates on them here so I've just changed the due date of that one there to uh, so that it comes in today so I'll see that there on the 8th of March and I can go into it and I can see what the story is and I might see well I'm still waiting for the pre contract questionnaire to come back from my client before I can do anything else, you know, so um, I don't think there's anything. So I think that's just, oh yeah, there's a, there's a step there to, uh, to write to the client. So uh, I think that that will bring in a whole, I won't go into that now because it'll bring in a whole lot of, um, it will bring in everything because everything is outstanding at this stage because I haven't completed the instruction sheet anyway. John, can I just ask a question? You know this yeah. issue, yeah. say, of putting in the contacts at the very beginning? Oh, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just seeing here, let's see, you've got do letter of engagement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, presumably, that's all kind of, is that all happening at the same, how does that fit in time-wise with where you are at the moment, let's say? Would that oh, you'd, be doing, right? you'd be doing, I'm not, yeah, I think the the girls are familiar with that, so you know I'm not going to do that. But they, because that's the way they, um, that's the way Andrea and Caroline would do. They they see the step there, and Ashley comes to me with the section 150. She does them, you know. I don't say do the section 150, you know. They do them, so I don't think that's an issue. But yes, you would. You mean at the at the um, at the very start, you'd go down through all of these and do them. You'd Confirm that you have the file the opening form completed. Um, you do the conflict search. You do the section fifty letter. Uh, so I just so that will just it says do the section one fifty letter. Um, do you wish to write a covering letter? This will slow us down a bit now, but anyway, I'll do it so that everybody can see what's. So this puts in the scope of instructions here. You can flesh this out if you want to, but it just it's drawn the information in from what I just put in. So it's purchase of dwelling house agricultural land at whatever the address is. And um, your you can put in likely costs. Likely costs. Of cost. We always go with the likely costs. So it brings in the <clears throat> the um, fee from the from here brings in the fee from this item here, which goes in at the start. Now, if you haven't got that in when you open the file, it will be a step behind you to put it in. Somebody saying something? Uh, so it asks you if there are any costs to date. So if you haven't heard cost today, I'll ask you how much they are. So that's actually the amount of, so I've used this file a lot as a test file. It has built up a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, let's say you've done some work already. So then you're, so this is the, this is what you're talking about, Christopher, here is the, um, so the only contact that would be in at the start of the file is the client themselves. Sorry, just on the contacts, you, do you need to take particular care? Let's say it's the name of the client. Presumably, the client's name will will be pulled into the various documents you're producing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so, therefore, you need to be clear that that's the name that is on the folio if they're selling. Or oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah what I find is people. What I find is people have a client would say who have you've done work for in the past would say a couple, two names, 
and then one of them is selling a property that they own themselves, you can't use that client, the couple. You have to set okay. up a new client. For, so you have to set up a yeah. new client entity then. Yeah. Yeah, okay. the, yeah. Set up a new client okay. for the for one person that's. So it asks you, do you want to um, do the payment on account? You usually don't. That just that just put, brings in brings in a line saying that one two hundred and fifty. So this is to do the covering letter. So the two actually the file opening form is open there. <laughs> so that opened up when when the uh, file was opened. So that's the section 150 there. Be all familiar with that. So I don't think you normally wouldn't have to do anything. You might have to tidy it up a bit. There might be some uh, paragraph headings and that that are on the wrong page. And the section and the um, covering letter. So I'll just go out of those. So, and that it's asking for the time. I won't put in the time. So you just you would just print those. I'm doing this for the benefit of people who've never seen it before. <laughs> so you just print the you print the two of them. Then, not printing them. Okay, two. So, um. So just to get back up here, then we have the pre-contract questionnaire. If you're not going to send out the pre-contract questionnaire, you're not going to bother with it, then just uh, delete it or whatever. I'm just going to complete it there now because it's done. So then you have the alternative, I suppose, is the instructions sheet. So um, don't have very much information for, for this client at the moment, so but I'll run through it anyway. So this is just filling up the information that I have, which isn't very much. But this is to print the instructions sheet. So what I'm suggesting is that when the secretary opens the file and they have no information whatsoever or very little, they would print this off and give it to the to the solicitor, the fee earner to complete. And um, it corresponds with this, with this um, form here, the one convincing instructions purchase. It's the same information in the same order. So um, I think we were during the reviews. We were um, we were suggesting that you know the secretaries might put in as much information as you you know usually you'd get just the um, the first thing you'll know about it is the the um, sales advice note from the auctioneer. So you mightn't know anything else. So I'm going to do it on the basis that we've got the sales advice note from the auctioneer. Um, and um, maybe the vendor. So you don't know whether your client is getting a mortgage or not, so we leave that blank, or you may know it. Um, so all of this information then is to do with the with the mortgage. Actually, what we'll do is we'll, we'll say the client is getting a mortgage, but we don't know where it's coming from or how much it's going to be. <clears throat> so all the rest of this, you haven't got the letter of loan offer, so you can blank that. It's, but if you had, you, you would tick the box. If you don't, it's, it should be clear. If you don't know the mortgage account number. This is whether or not you're getting, client is getting a private loan. So you'll have to do the um, deed of confirmation. Um, that's the intention of having that there. I'm not sure if it does remind you to do that or not. So if the contract is going to be subject to loan, I think in all cases now, we're making them subject to loan. So we're going to say yes. Uh, is it a commercial undertaking? Uh, yeah, I think in this case it will be. Well, I'll leave it blank for the time being. But it's not a commercial undertaking because is your 
is your purchase subject to a sale? You're going to say no. So then uh, this is the co-ownership. Uh, so this won't apply here because we've only got one client. So uh, now if it was joint, if it was tenants in common, you put in the shares in here. If you know what they are, if, they, if you don't know what they are at the moment, don't put in anything. Is it going to be your client's family home? Let's say it is. This <coughs> fiduciary capacity is if your client is acting in the fiduciary capacity, which isn't very often. So I won't follow with that. I won't go into that. And, and you can, if you're the beneficiary of your client, is set up as a separate client, you can put that in there, or you can set them up. So you already have the property type. You can put in the auctioneer code in there if you want. I just put that in because it it comes into the questionnaire. Uh, so we put in the purchase price. Have you have has the client paid a booking deposit? You say yes, and the amount. So this will um, don't know if this makes a huge. Yeah, it will probably yes. Yeah, so it will come into when you're doing the the completion statement at the end. It will it will uh, have significance. Um, so this is <clears throat> this one here is only if the deposit is not ten percent. So if it's more or less, you know, sometimes it's less than ten percent. The closing date, if you know what it is, you can put it in there, leave it blank. So then I'm following the um, the questionnaire. So the next item on the questionnaire, or the next issue is whether or not the property has water supply. So we will say it has a good water scheme. Whether it's what the drainage is. Uh, whether estate sewers obviously has to do with the house in a housing estate that hasn't been taken in charge. Mains obviously is in uh, urban property, uh, private drainage scheme. So usually it would be either main sewers or a septic tank on the property. So I'm going to say it's a septic tank on the property. Access is usually public road might be an estate road in a housing estate. It might be adjoining the client's property, so access isn't an issue, or you might have to get a right of way. Or there may be a right of way. I'm going to go with public road, which is the most usual thing. So then these two questions here wouldn't be in the, I don't think they're in the questionnaire, but in other words, do you want, are you going to need easements? Are you going to need an easement to get to the property? So I'll I'll take that one just to show how it works. And are you going to have you're going to have easements reserved over the property? I'm going to take that one as well. So management company is the next question. This will only be uh, for an apartment or whatever, or sometimes where there's a um, management company in a housing estate. So you put in the management company name there, the type of company that it is, usually it's guarantee. So obviously this doesn't apply in this case because we're talking about like a house and agricultural land. Uh, the next question is, do you and does the client intend to change the use or carry out any new development? Um, so that's just yes or no. And if that's the case, then is it going to be subject to planning? Now, this question here, I'm not sure why this is in here, but I put it in anyway. This is if there's any, if there's been recent development, so that you have to get a planning permission or you have to make sure that there's a planning permission for whatever recent development there is. Uh, the next questions then are to do with searches, planning search. Are you going to do you need to carry out a planning search or a search for? Um, well, it, it's essentially a planning search because all of that stuff will come into the planning search. So do you want to carry out a planning search? So we'll say that you do. And do you want to carry out an NHA SAC search? We'll say you don't have to, you're, you're not doing that. So the next question, are there any contents included? So I'll say yes. 
and that those contents could be anything like uh, in this case it could be farm machinery or something like that i don't know so um, but usually it's you know usually it's just white goods or whatever you know so you could if it's white goods if it's just a short statement you can just put it in there you know and i'm going to put in c inventory so if you put in c inventory you can it will um that's what will come into the document. So um, put in the contents value if you want to, or if you need to, obviously yeah. this is going to have an impact on, so if it's significant, it's going to have an impact on stamp duty. So I'll put in 10,000 euro. Is there any stamp duty relief? Um, most of the time, this is just not applicable. There is no stamp duty relief. Um, this is to do with, this is a question that's asked on the stamp duty return. I don't know what the purpose of it is, but I usually put in the top one here. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to find out what, I don't know if anybody ever asks the client, what, what size is your house for the stamp duty return? So the next question is if you're, um, if the, Vendor and purchaser are related. That doesn't apply anymore now. It might be consanguinity relief, but uh, usually it's none. So the next question is, um, has your client done a survey? So we'll say you don't know. And as the, is the report satisfactory? You don't know. Likewise, is the property correctly identified on the land registry map? For the moment you don't know. Do you want to, the next item then is to do with flooding. Do you want to have a flood risk investigation carried out? I'm going to say no, because it's on the top of a hill, let's say. Um, then home bond premier guarantee, this is only to do with um, new New houses or recently built houses where the guarantee is still in in place, so you don't do anything here with dwelling house and agricultural land. This is also to do with uh, a new house, so this is to split up the price between the um, between the the building contract and the site cost. If that's um, that's the way it's set up. Um, so obviously that's going to have an impact on VAT. So when you come to calculate your stamp duty, it will take the VAT off the off whatever you put in here. Are you going to get vacant possession? So in most cases that would be yes. Is there a VAT liability? Probably not. Uh, no. So you know you only have a VAT liability usually with. Um, recently built um, commercial premises. Now the next question then has to do with uh, the value of the non-residential part. So um, I'm going to say that, well, you actually, you probably wouldn't know that at this stage, but obviously with a dwelling house and agricultural land, you're going to have to split up the price between the residential part and the non-residential part. So that's the significance of that. But I'll leave it blank for the time being, being because you probably wouldn't know um, whether it, it is what the, what the values are. Um, is there agricultural entitlements? I'm going to say no. Is there forestry? No. So if there was forestry, you'd be putting in the value of the trees, if you knew it. So obviously that's going to have um, it's going to be relevant for stamp duty. Then the local property tax, you probably won't know what the local property tax, um, I think I've got those in the wrong order, but anyway, you probably don't know what the local property tax uh, amount is going to be, but you probably know that it's liable, it's going to be liable for local property tax. The other, all the other um, exemptions are set out there Usually it's liable. 
So if you were, if for instance, you came to this question and you're dealing with commercial property or whatever, obviously you're going to take not applicable because it doesn't apply. So there are, or it's not habitable or whatever, or if you don't know. Anyway, I'm going to say it's liable. Have you got the receipt? Well, you won't have the receipt, so. And then have you got the NPPR discharge? You won't know at this stage, so I'll put in no, you haven't got it. So when you've fulfilled all those in, then you just click on apply and OK. <clears throat> so that's. Um, so it will vary a lot as to what stage you do that at, because, you know, it depends on what. Um, how the how your client gives you instructions and all that kind of thing. Um, so let's say you've only got the I'm going on the basis that I've only got the um, sales advice note. The secretary has got this has been asked to open the file. All they've got is the sales advice note, so they've put in what they think they can put in, etc. So then you would you would um, Revert this now so that God, get out of it. So then you would complete the um, that form with the information that you've uh, obtained so far. So it's just so that's so that form is is pretty much the same as the what I just run through there. So the first section there has to do with the client. Client details is taken out of partner out of the. So you don't have the tax number. All you have is the client's name. You know the client is married. The date of marriage. You don't have the marriage certificate and so on. You know the spouse's name, uh, etc. So then you have the. Um, transaction information, so you know it's a dwelling house and cultural land. So, um, so all the details that I've gone through are in there. So I would suggest that you print that off, and um, give it to the fee earner to flesh out if there's more information or if they're not. I mean you. You know, you may be at the stage that you don't know. And um, so you can use it as well. If you're seeing the client, you can use it as well as a checklist to go through what information you need. If you're taking instructions uh, personally. <clears throat> that is if you haven't used the questionnaire or whatever. Or when the questionnaire comes back, that can be. Well, you could probably work off the questionnaire and flesh out what I've um, what I've been through there, what I've gone through there. Now, the way that I usually do it is I take this step here, complete instruction sheet. You can do this as well. Uh, and it just does the same thing. It just goes into what I've been through there. It just goes into the, to the client information. And then it goes on to the, to the, um, to the form that I've just gone through there. And when you go out of it, it asks you, have you completed it or have you not completed it? So if you if you um, say it's not completed, it won't do anything. If you say you have completed it, then it will. will put in a whole lot of reminders. <laughs> Sorry, before you go, <clears throat> well, actually, it will remind you to put in the. Put in the context, so this is where the context comes in, so It'll remind you here to put in the solicitors, auctioneers, etc. So I'll do that. So to do that, you just go down here to the contacts. And so we have the client and we have the solicitors. I'll put in the auctioneers. So we we'll put in. In Smith Kelly Scott. Um, 
So there they are. I need you need to select the address and phone numbers, emails, etc. Usually I find that you don't need the auctioneer so much on a purchase, it's on a sale that you need them. So you put in the um the contacts. So if you go okay then uh, so then you go next. So then it'll bring in a whole lot of, it'll do a whole lot of stuff here. <laughs> now it's probably doing a good deal more than would normally be the case because you haven't uh, you haven't got full instructions. So um, so it says the next item there says you've completed the instruction sheet. So then you have a step to do the attendance note. So I'm going to do that. So let's say you. You did see the client and you got their instructions. The date of the attendance, whether it was a personal attendance or telephone. And it actually runs through the, the instructions sheet again. So if you've seen the client and you've taken instructions, you have more information. So it will and you can print this off and Mary Daly, you can print it off and stick it on the file and Mary Daly will be delighted to see it there. Um, so that's the instruction sheet. So that's the attendance note. So it's just that one just so that at that stage or in that format, it just says see instruction sheet. So you can add in whatever you want in there, whatever any other information or any other details that you've been given. And the time is five units. So you can print those off. So then you have all the other, um, so you have reminders then to get the stuff that you haven't got. You have, it says get missing tax numbers. So this is a fairly, um, this step is a fairly, um, comprehensive one in the sense that it gives you all sorts of um, options to get a new tax number, to verify the tax number, uh, etc., to write to the client for the tax number. Um, I think if you go to get new tax number, it will ask you what do you want to write to the client with the form REG1? Or do you want to send the, maybe you have the REG1 to send it to revenue or to um, social welfare. So I'll, let's say you've completed it. So there's the letter to, sorry, there's the letter to um, Carrick for the, for the PPS number. So let's say you've sent that off. It actually, yeah, sorry. Uh, so you'll see down there, there's a question with, there's a step with a question mark on it. So that, that'll have a question mark on it until, or it will be like that. It's, it's, it's essentially querying, have you sent the, the REG one to social welfare? So when you print it, it'll go, it'll change. So it's it says there it says now that the form REG one has been sent to social welfare, and then the next one the next reminder then is to confirm that you've got the new tax number, and there's the reminder there has the client sent back the section one fifty so we we'll say that the client has get rid of that. Um, John, can I just ask, yeah. are those reminders just appearing on your screen? They are. Will they, are. Will they the appear, moment. let's say, if Caroline or Andrea open up the matter, will they appear on their screen as well? How, how does that work? Well, they will do, yeah. Well, they will. The, yeah, yeah. They'll, well, well, these the reminders down on the left hand side are only mine. They won't appear on. Now, you could change that so that, so that they can kind of appear on the here on the 
the secretary's screen as well, you know. So that if something if if something comes up. Um now as it's set up at the moment, that doesn't happen with other people's files, it happens with mine, but I can easily change that so that it um it uh, it will appear on everyone's files. Um, so uh, this one there is it reminds you to get the marriage certificate. So you could um, you could do that now, or you could leave it. Reminds you to get the price or value of the non-residential contents if there are any. Obviously, that's going to have an effect on stamp duty. It says check if the contract is subject to planning. I thought we had done that. All right, I haven't finished with so planning. <clears throat> so, so I can just get rid of it now. So that's obviously something that I've missed, so that's going to happen. You're going to miss something, but you're going to get a reminder that you've missed it. So, uh, so it asks me if I've got instructions. And. No, it's not subject to planning. Now the next thing, it, you know, that could be an issue, so it asks me to do an attendance note. I'm not going to do an attendance note because it's just something that I. That I, um, that I just overlooked. So the exchange now to contract is not subject to planning. Uh, get instructions reclosing date. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a loan, and have you got your letter of loan offer? Get the valuation for the non-residential part, so you can you can write to the auctioneers for that. So you can send them an email. I'll send them a letter. I don't want to. See. <laughs> I don't want to, to send Junior Smith. An email about something that he doesn't know anything about. So that's the letter there looking for the valuation. Sorry, it just keeps. Um, so I've, let's assume that I, I pretend I printed that and it's gone. Um, so I won't go through any of the others. Obviously, there's different ones. Check if the survey has been done, uh, confirm the property is correctly identified. The map. So you may not know any of these um, at this stage, but they're still they'll still be there to, to remind you that you have to do this. I go into this one here just to the letter that's attached here. This this step here or this option here, write to the client is in a lot of these and what it does is it just brings in a letter. I don't use it that often. It just brings in a letter to the client to. To deal with. Um, deal with outstanding instructions. It'll take a couple of seconds for it to because it's a lot in it. But essentially it will write to the client in respect of all of these outstanding items, so. I just need to tidy it up a bit. So it's looking for the PPS number. It's asking to send back the letter of engagement. Well, we've actually got the letter of engagement back. It's looking for photographic ID or proof of ID, marriage certificate. Uh, whether a survey has been done, well, the property is correctly identified. Um, what the contents are. Uh, so, uh, residential uh, value of the non residential part. So, you could amend this. If you wanted to use this, you could just take out the bits that, that don't make sense. I mean, there's one there about the inventory that doesn't make sense, but, uh, well, actually, you could, you could send the inventory with that. Um, if you intend to carry out any redevelopment, I thought we had dealt with that, but anyway, um, and so on. So you could send that to the client suitably amended.
a while just so it's called letter to client for instructions. So and a lot of these reminders here, it will you'll get that. Um, so if we complete this one comes up as well, right to client. That's the same letter again. So um, I won't go through any more of those. So just to move the thing on, then <clears throat> the last step here, the one that with the due date is, is um, confirm that draft contracts have been received. So I'm going to say that we have received the contracts. So, <laughs> so when you go into this, if you're, sh you're shown all the steps that you haven't dealt with. Um, so you could get out of it again and, and deal with anything that you feel you need to deal with before moving on to this one. So let's say that we have the, now this is a bit tricky here in that um, there are other options apart from this. It's proceeding on the basis that your purchase is by private treaty, but you could have the option that the client has already purchased the property at auction, which often happens. You're just told, I bought this property at auction last week. <laughs> and it's the first that you know about it. There is a step writing you can take, you can write, if you haven't got the contracts, you can write to the uh, solicitors requesting the contracts or if the matter is not proceeding and then there's an option to change the case type from a sale to a purchase or whatever, but I, I don't think I've ever used that. I don't know why I put that in there, but it's in there anyway. Um, and you can see that that step is already in there. It's the last item there, right? Requesting draft contracts. Um, so I'm going to say that uh, we've actually got the contract. So then it asks you, is it is it by private treaty or is it to be purchased at auction? In other words, there's three options. It's a purchase by private treaty. It's already been purchased at auction or it's going to be purchased at auction. In other words, the auction is coming up. So um, I'll just, so then it asks you to make sure that you're doing, that you're going in the right direction as it were, because once you go in, if you put in, well, it's not fatal, but if you go, if you put in to be purchased at auction, you'll get, you'll get, uh, you'll essentially get a workflow that relates to purchasing a property at auction rather than by private treaty. There isn't a huge difference, but it will uh, be just a, a nuisance to change it. So we'll say that we have it right. So it asks you up there. So it's warning you up there if you're if you're taking the correct option. So we'll say we've got the contracts today. And then it just checks, just check if the details are correct. So this is the information that you'll already probably already have. Or if you don't, you can put it in here now. And this, sorry, I'll just mention this first sheet here. The top one here is the general details, which uh, the secretaries will be familiar with this one. And it just has the basic details relating to the, and you can use this one for other kind of stuff like a voluntary transfer or a remortgage or whatever, uh, something that isn't a sale or purchase, but it also will have the basic details in relation to the sale and the purchase. Um, did I go into that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I went into that too. You can change the, if that information is wrong, you can change it here. Okay. So uh, it asks you, do you have solicitors added to context? Well, we've already done that. So we don't need to do that. So that's all that does. So then it, down here, then you'll see that it says you've received the contracts and then you have two steps uh, which have due dates on them or reminders. They'll, they'll, you'll see them up here. Uh, I'll just change these to today so that you can see what I'm talking about. So 
So they're at the top of that list there. So they could be somewhere in that list there. So, so I suppose uh, now, you know, um, if there's some urgency with it, it doesn't matter which order you take these steps in, but if there's some urgency with it, I just send the contract out to the client. If you're sending the contract to the client, I just take this one. So you have, so it asks you, um, you haven't done the other one. So it's assuming that you should be doing the other one, but so it asks you, do you want to do the other one? So, um, so I'm going to say you, you do, still want to do it. Um, so this is get contract signed by client. So the options here are yes, so that you'll, so then you'll, uh, I'll, when I, I'll show you what happens then. So if you've already written to the client or the contracts are already signed, or you can write to the client to call to sign the contracts, whichever, usually it's this one. Uh, so then it asks you, are you going to include you want to get the mortgage documents drafted now. So we haven't got a letter of loan offer, so obviously we won't be doing that. So they'll be executed later. So then the options are for getting the contract signed are an attendance, obviously, a letter to the client. And sometimes if there's a bit of urgency or the clients are abroad or whatever, I send an email with an authority to me to sign the contract. Um, so I'll do the attendance. So again, it asks you, I don't know why it does that, but it asks you again if mortgage documents are going to be signed. So no, because we don't have them. So it's still calling it a letter to sign contracts, but it's actually in attendance. So you, need, you can ignore that, the fact that it's calling it that up there. It is in attendance. It's just in the same, it's just the same document. So it, it changes the. So that's the, that's the attendance. So it goes through the, the format of the attendance as it were. It's almost an agenda for the attendance. Now you can amend this, to whatever in whatever way you want to. So um, so obviously it sets out the advice that you're going to give to the client. You could do this afterwards as well, I suppose, after you've seen the client and you can change it around to whatever way you want. So it covers um, it covers the survey, it covers the um, boundaries, it covers the mortgage, and um, life cover and all that kind of thing. And you can put in whatever else you want to into it. As a reminder there to print the workflow. So I'll do that in a minute. So um, as I said, you could do that before or after the, before or after the, the actual attendance. So I'm just going to print that. We're not going to print it rather. Um, so then you have a whole lot of other reminders there. If you've got the deposit from the client, so it reminds you to get the mortgage documents signed. Uh, I think another reminder has come in there about the tax number of it. And then um, group water scheme letters. Um, because you put in um, I probably shouldn't have done it <laughs> in that order, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I should have probably done the completion of the title details first, but I'll do it, I'll do it now anyway. Um, so the last, um, so you have the, the, the new step has been put in there, or a new reminder, confirm contracts have been signed by the client. Um, so they may or may not have been. So anyway, I'll go on to the title details. So there's a form, there was a form right up there at the start, title details, so that's a blank form. And um, you can take this step here, or you can just go into the, you can just go into the title details here, whichever you want. If you haven't got all the information, you're probably better doing it this way. 
<laughs> but I'll do it the way I do it anyway. So it asks you, do you want to complete the title details? So I'm saying yes. So then it takes you through. Now this is a this is probably the trickiest bit of it, but um, well, in most cases it probably isn't going to be that tricky, but it could be. So this is the title information. So obviously it has the property address and the type of property already in it and the fact that it's purchased. So is it registered title? So we'll say that it's registered title. And it could be also part, part of it could be unregistered title. So I'll say it isn't because uh, this isn't really set up for unregistered title. <clears throat> so I leave the unregistered title out of it. But you could tick both boxes or you could have only you could have only um, an unregistered title, whichever. You won't get as much. Uh, you won't get as much with the unregistered title, but you just have to you'll have to draft a lot of the documents from scratch. So what county is it in? Obviously, for land registry purposes, you know the folio number now. You remember you've got the contract now, so you've got the contract and all the title documents, so you know all this information. So we put in a folio number. And we'll put in a townland. And just to make it interesting, we'll put in. You're getting part of a folio as well. You're getting. All of folio one, two, three, four, five, F, and you're getting part of folio four, five, six, seven, eight. You say it's the same townland. So then it asks you what color is it on the map? Usually it's red. Now there's a plan, there's a, an option there, plan numbers. So sometimes you don't need a subdivision map because you're getting a plan, num you're getting a whole plan off the land registry map. So you don't, you can describe the, the part being sold by reference to the plan number. We we'll say it's red. And is there a letter? If there's a letter. And then you can tick this box if it's a case that you're getting all of the folio except the part that's being described. So I'll say that's not the case here. I uh, don't think the area is in hectares is any is any of any great relevance of any longer. But I'll put in put in the hectares or put in the area anyway. It'll come into your when you draft the deed, it'll refer to uh, the area. The land registry do, don't record areas anymore, I think. Um, so then it asks you, well, is any of the is the folio possessory title? We'll say we'll say that four or five six seven eight F has a possessory title. And this next step then or this next box then is to do if there's a dealing pending, in other words, if the the vendor's registration is still pending in the land registry, I won't do that. The next two items aren't really current for um or not. You can ignore them for the at this stage because they're just the dealing number when the dealing is lodged. They probably shouldn't really be here. But anyway, um and the new folio number when your registration is completed, so you can ignore those. I think I might get rid of those or move them out of there altogether. It will only confuse people. Then it asks you the question, is the title leasehold? I'm going to say it isn't because I don't want to complicate matters too much. So if you tick the box leasehold, you go all the way down to fiduciary capacity. Um, you can ignore the rest of the um, fields until you get to fiduciary capacity. Fiduciary capacity obviously has to do with, you'll be familiar with it from the stamp duty return. So you can have, but if, usually it's a person representative if there is. I'm going to say that there's a person representative, that you're purchasing from a person representative. And who is the, uh, then it asks you what's the, what's the, um, 
type of um, grant of representation it is. Um, and we'll put in then in the deceased typing isn't very good. Uh, this asks you if there if the vendor is a surviving joint tenant. Um, obviously not in this case. If the vendor is a surviving joint tenant, well, who's the deceased joint tenant? And which it might be only one of the folio numbers that is in the joint names. So you put in the folio number there. The next question is, um, is the vendor acting under a power of attorney? That would be rare enough. Receiver would be acting under a power of attorney. So if you've got a receiver selling up here, then you put you tick that box. But you would say in this case there isn't. So then you have the information that you already put in in relation to services. So at this stage, you're probably checking that these are your you've been told by your client that as far as they're aware, that it joins a public road and that. There's a safety tank on the property and that this water is supplied by group water scheme. So you might change these because at this stage you've got the contract and you've got the replies to requisition, so you know what position is. I'll leave them as they are. So then at the next uh, question is, have you got a letter of re-roads and services? Did you get a letter of re-roads and services? So I'm going to leave this blank because I haven't got it. I'll say that I haven't got it. Um, don't know why how that box got ticked. But so that's um, that says pre sixty three or no development. So I don't know if this is any great relevance. Well, obviously it is to a purchaser, but um, I don't know if it if it affects the production of documents or not. Um, so I'm going to say that it is pre sixty three. Oh no, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll, but it isn't pre-63 or no development. Uh, this, this one here is if there's any exempt development, so there might be an extension or something. This one, have you been provided with the BER cert? Let's say you have, you could, you could pick on file or yes, it doesn't matter. Management company, again, we can ignore these because it doesn't apply, but it's the same information that we've been that I mentioned earlier and likewise this information here has to do with a new house um, so I think that's everything on that so I'm going to apply and go on to the next one so it'll bring you on to the next one so this one then is to do with burdens Um, so usually you have something like sport, well, something, you usually have something like sporting rights. So I'll put in sporting rights. So obviously you don't know who the owner of those are. They're registered. So we we'll put in an entry number. This is working from the folio now. So I can't remember what folio numbers I had, but you'll have them in front of you anyway. I put in one of the folio numbers. I think it's one, two, three, four, five. And obviously, there won't be an undertaking in relation to that. And it's not, the property is not subject to, you're not taking the property subject to, to those rights. You're being told that they're no longer exercised. Let me see what else. You could put in, if, there's a, if there are other burdens like, um, the land annuity, for instance. So I'll put in the land annuity as well, just but there's a whole lot of them there. And they have they'll bring up different documents and reminders, etc. Those tick boxes are a bit tricky in that they don't that's no. And that's that's no, that's yes, and that's 
blank or neither. But they, you have to keep going through them until you get the, the right one. So that's uh, burdens. So they'll be on. You could be working from those from part three on the um, of the folio. You might say that you're just duplicating what's in the folio, but what it will do is it will bring in on the list of we'll see in a minute on the list of documents it will bring in. Um, it will bring in what you need to deal with those. So planning then is the next one. So you can have all different types of planning documents. Um, it's not just planning, it's fire safety. It's all that area to do with, um, with planning and fire safety, building regulations, etc. Um, so uh, I'll just make, usually it's just a planning permission. The, th the pre 92 has to do with the fact that there were no regulations pre 90, no building regulations pre 92. So you're not looking for a certificate of compliance with building regulations. So I'll just put in a planning permission and put in make up one. I, uh, after, I'm not a very good typist, so. I say there are no financial conditions on the planning permission. So I, sorry, I've just put in a planning permission. That's the planning permission authorizing some development on the property. Uh, if there are financial conditions, you could put in the, the number of the Whatever it is, usually it won't be one with the planning permission of that age. And have you got a receipt for it? Say there is. Is there a certificate of compliance? Um, say there is. I'll come back to that now in a minute. So we put in. And uh, I'll be the engineer. In the the date of the certificate of compliance and the engineer in there. You'll see the relevance of this in a minute. Um, I just put in another planning permission just to. Um, explain the rest of it. So your um, your certificate of compliance might cover the two planning permissions, in which case if it does, then you just say the same as above, or uh, it might not, or you mightn't have a cert you mightn't have been given a certificate of compliance, so you you would um, bring no there. If it's pre seventy five, you don't need a certificate of compliance. Um, so I'm going to say the same as above, so that means that. The engineer has covered the two planning permissions in in the one certificate of compliance. And the other thing you can do is if you've got another sorry, if you've got another um, oops. Anyway, I, I won't <laughs> I won't go back through that again. I removed it by accident. Um, if you've got another certificate of compliance, you can put it in. You can. Put that in there and put in the details as well. Sometimes you'll have a, a second certificate of compliance. Um, and obviously sometimes you have two certificates, one to do with building relations and one to do with um, 
planning. I usually don't split them up if they're the same engineer and they're the same date, but you could do that. You could put in, you could put in the same if they, if it's um, if you the second one. And those little dashes are in there so that if it's left blank, something will come in. You can get rid of them when you're putting in the information. So I'm just saying there, there's a cer second certificate of compliance. It could be to do with billing re regulations or whatever. So and it's just, I don't know if I need to fill this in or not. It's an additional certificate anyway. So that's the planning. So the next one then is to do with easements. Now these are not easements that are in existence. These are, you'll remember we ticked the box that there were going to be easements granted and there were going to be easements reserved. This has to do with two things, the special conditions in your contract and your deed of transfer. So uh, I just put these in. There's a reminder in there to put those in. So we we'll say we're getting a right of way and it's the usual color yellow. And it's on one of those folios, I think is, doesn't matter. There's And we'll say our right is going to be reserved for, say, a water main. It's usually blue. I'll put in the same folio number. It could be the other one. So you remember I had two folio numbers. I had one part folio and one whole folio. So obviously the purchaser is keeping part of the other folio. So you could, it could be the case that the right of way is needed to go through the whole folio that's being transferred to get to the bit that he's keeping. Um, so that's that done. And then this is to do with unregistered title documents or anything else that's of an unusual nature that you might be looking for. Um, don't know what that would be. So, I mean, this is just, this, you just put in the, if it's unregistered title documents, you just put in the, whatever it is, conveyance date, such and such made between so and so and so and so, et cetera. And you put in the, this is to do more with drafting the contract on a sale. So you put in what it what it does here. So in this case, if you had some kind of document, it would be other because it doesn't relate to the title. Can't think of anything that I don't know. Um, direct site notice or something like that. So we've done that, so that's so then it asks you, have you completed those details or have you not completed them? So you can, if you haven't, then you can, you can um, pick the first one if you have. So when you do that, then it, it um, it'll, it'll bring in some more reminders. Uh, So the only thing there that the only additional thing there is check planning conditions. I put this in because I had a case once where I was acting on the purchase of property up in Donegal and um, when we got the when we got the contract, when we got the planning permission, it the planning permission said the property could be it was residential, it could be used for holiday home only. My clients wanted to live in it, so that was the end of that. So I put that in there to check planning conditions for that kind of thing. The other one is, of course, the, um, what do they call it? The, um, where the applicant has to be the first person to reside in the property or has to reside in it for so many years and that kind of thing. So I assume that I've checked those and that they're okay. 
Now, these two steps here are the next step that you would take in. In. Um, when you've when you've got your contract, we'll say the contracts have been signed by the client. Now you wouldn't have this list of ordinarily you wouldn't have this list of binders up there because you'd have gone through them. I'm not going through them now because I want to move on with the thing. But you'd have you would have um, gotten rid of as many of them as you could. Uh, so you when you say that the client has signed the contracts, the next step. The next one with the due date is right to the vendor's list of signed contracts. Now you may not want to do that at this stage because you have all this stuff to do. You've looked at the title documents, so you have to go back then on with your rejoinders on title. So this drafts that letter. Uh, it takes a bit of a while as it runs through all the information. And you, unfortunately, with this, it kind of freezes everything. It freezes Word and it freezes Partner. So I can't go back into Partner. Probably notice that with shorter documents, but with long, with long documents like this, it freezes it for a while. But you could be, uh, I don't know, copying documents or something. I don't know, whatever. So it's just running through the information that we are checking the information, checking what's in the document in the letter against the information that that we've put in. So it's the reason it takes it's doing this is or it takes so long is because it has to check everything. It's probably not a very efficient way of doing it, but it was the most um, was the easiest way that I could do it. Um, so there's your letter with rejoinders on title. So this is the, I mean, this is the way that I do it. I mean, I see some people, they send you the contract and they, they send you the signed contract and deposit and they say, here's our list of closing documents or, which I think is, I think it's too late then, you know, you've signed the contract and you're setting out what closing documents you want. In my opinion, you should be doing it before you sign, before you send back the signed contract. Now, I suppose you could say that they're sending it subject to the signed contract, but it's a bit late to be getting all that uh, sorted out. Um, so the first section here, the rejoinders. So this just picks up. So this just picks up stuff that um, that you may or may not have information on. So you need so you'll need to amend this here. So it deals with uh, it asks you to confirm that the contents are included. So that might or might not have been in the replies to requisitions. So we'll say that they did deal with it in the replies to requisitions. So you can get rid of that. And then the value, we say they didn't cover the value. So the next one then is the to confirm that the septic tank and percolation area are, are entirely contained within the boundaries shown on the land registry filed plan. You're asking them to furnish a letter from the group water scheme because the water supplies group water scheme. Furnish a letter that from the local authority that roads and services are in charge. So I think um, we didn't tick the box that we had that. So that's why that's there. And then you're asking them to put a value on the non-residential part of the property if you haven't got that. I suppose it's the vendor who should be providing that rather than I know we wrote to the we wrote to the auctioneer looking for that. Probably shouldn't be doing that. Sometimes I do it just to save time. So then the next um, so you can um, you can obviously you're going to go through your replies to requisitions and if you spot anything else that isn't um, is of concern, you would put it in there by reference to the appropriate requisition. John. Yeah, John, I have to. Yes, I'm afraid I have to sign off. I'm afraid. Um, is how how much longer do you do? Will it take just to finish the? Uh, there's a good bit in it yet, but maybe what we'll do is we'll go back to it next week. 
Yeah, I think so, because there's a lot in that. And yeah. we're about I mean, halfway through it. <laughs> so Yeah. I mean, I, I, I imagine the thing to do at this point is to try and get everybody sort of setting up their files in a way where they're going to, as it were, process the file via this particular system. Mm -hmm. That would strike me that you've got to get your context set up. You've got to get the initial instructions to correctly, correctly set up and get yeah. that all that all area set up. And then strikes me then that if you kind of follow what you're advising there and you complete the, the various put in input the correct information, it nearly drives itself. It, yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 Um, OK, well, what I'll do is I'll just finish this up and um, uh, we can we can um, we can reconvene Sunday next week. Does that suit everybody? I can send out a, a, an invitation anyway for uh, next Tuesday or whatever day next week suits. Um, so then it, so these are the these are, this is your requisition 45. Now, when I'm acting for a vendor, I fill in the requisition 45. I'm saying this is what I'm going to give you. <laughs> and if you want anything else, you better ask me now. And of course, a lot of the time I don't I don't get asked for anything else. So I can then say, well, this is what I told you I was going to give you, you know. So all of the. The documents that we put in there, so the certificates, the two certificates on compliance are in there. So the letter for the um, financial conditions are in there, etc. It covers property, local property tax, um, apportionment details, etc. So you'd send, so you tidy that up and send it off to um, the other side. I usually email it. Um, so the other one then is drafting. You can draft the special conditions. I won't go into that now. We'll do that next week. I think we can take we can pick up from here next week if everybody's. Um, Is that OK with everyone?